Welcome back. This is part two of the uh, video lecture about contempt. Um, so we've been talking about uh, uh, contempt, both in terms of common law contempt, and I've mentioned that's kind of uh, a very small part of what we need to think about. The main focus really needs to be strict liability contempt. Uh, when we've talked about the um, the Contempt of Court Act 1981 uh, and the basic definition of strict liability contempt being a uh, uh, publishing material which creates creates a substantial risk of serious prejudice or impediment to active proceedings and then we went on to look at when proceedings become active and when they cease to be active. Another issue you need to think about um, uh, is um, if there's an appeal. Of course if there's an appeal proceedings become active again so you need to be really on your toes to know when proceedings become active, cease to be active and then possibly become active again when there's an appeal. An appeal is, uh, only becomes active once the, um, uh, a, uh, the appeal has actually been lodged with the court. It's not just when someone says they're going to appeal, it's when they've actually lodged the paperwork with the court. But because it's, um, uh, it's very unlikely that you could uh, prejudice a judge and appeals are heard by judges and not juries, it's very unlikely that you're going to uh, risk have a, a great risk of um, causing a contempt when there's an appeal. But just be aware of it that a case can become active again even after it's been heard initially by a court. Up until now I've really been talking about criminal cases uh, but um, of course there are civil proceedings going on and they also uh, there's a, a risk of contempt so you, if uh, there are civil proceedings remember a dispute between individuals or an individual and an organization um, then just be aware that uh, those proceedings become active um, when uh, from the time that a, a date for the trial is fixed so that's when they become active and they cease to be active when the case is disposed of or when it's been dealt with there's a decision made um, so and again during that period of time you need to be careful you need to be careful to uh, uh, not to uh, report anything which is going to prejudice that case there's no jury in a civil proceeding so like appeals it's very unlikely that you're going to uh, prejudice uh, proceedings but it can still be uh, uh, risky if you were to contaminate witness evidence so you see the process here it's the, it's the legal system trying to protect any possibility that you as a reporter as a journalist can, can prejudice can create prejudice you can suggest someone is guilty you can um, make a, a witness feel uncomfortable in, about giving their evidence so that's what you've always got to think about if proceedings are active you mustn't do anything which is going to prejudice the proceedings um, uh, people will sometimes talk about the phrase sub judice and it doesn't actually really have a, a great meaning in um, uh, in British law uh, but uh, we saw early on with um, uh, common law contempt uh, that, that when uh, there is a risk when there's proceedings which are pending or imminent uh, and that's really what people are referring to when they say that they're sub judice so um, make sure you know your law and then you'll be able to uh, avoid people trying to threaten you away from uh, reporting things which you actually really can report on. Um, so just a couple of examples of uh, getting it wrong just interesting to see where other people have gone wrong we've already saw an example just from a, um, a week ago of the BBC getting it very wrong and um, uh, showing some footage from a court case from inside a court hearing is because it happened on video because of the lockdown uh, that um, they uh, forgot their law and uh, broke the rules of the court and I uh, opened themselves up to uh, an action for contempt. So this is uh, one, it's a little bit old now, uh, from 2001, but um, Lee Bowyer and Jonathan Woodgate, uh, quite famous footballers in their time, played for Leeds United um, and they were prosecuted uh, after they'd been involved in uh, some uh, a night out in, in Leeds uh, which had ended up with them allegedly chasing and beating up uh, a man uh, on the streets um, and there was a, uh, a racial background uh, dimension to it because it was an Asian man that they, uh, they, they were alleged to have attacked. The um, uh, trial took place and the jury was uh, considering its verdict and that weekend, while the jury was still considering its verdict, so they hadn't um, come back with their, their verdict, the Sunday Mirror went ahead and published a great big backgrounder um, from uh, the family of the, the victim, uh, and in which uh, it was um, uh, asserted that the Bowyer and Woodgate were, were guilty and said an awful lot of other things about them, which the jury had never heard before. Um, and this was a clear contempt. They'd created a serious 
a substantial uh, risk of serious prejudice uh, in that case because the, um, uh, they provided information and uh, prejudice to the jury. So the trial collapsed. The Sunday Mirror was fined £75,000 uh, for publishing that piece, which they admitted they had uh, uh, published in error. They, uh, they had planned it in, assuming that the jury would have been back uh, with their verdict by then, and they forgot to remove it uh, when the, when the jury's deliberations continued over the weekend and the editor had to resign so it was a really serious case and it shows how seriously the courts take these things Millie Dowler, many of you will know the name Millie Dowler who was basically at the heart of the whole uh, hacking scandal where journalists and private investigators were hacking into her voicemails when she went missing uh, sadly she was um, she had been abducted and killed uh, and she had been killed by a man called Levi Belfield um, now, he uh, was accused of a whole series of attacks on uh, other uh, women as well. Uh, and um, when the, uh, uh, the verdict came back on uh, the Millie Dowler case and uh, the, uh, the jury decided that uh, he was guilty of her murder, um, they were then, the jury uh, had not finished their deliberations. They went back to consider their um, uh, verdicts on the other charges and the other uh, attacks on, uh, on women. But the Daily Mail and the Mirror both uh, went ahead and published uh, their backgrounders. Uh, they brought in lots of new information about Levi Belfield uh, and the things that um, they had, he had done, which uh, meant that the jury uh, could no longer be trusted to make a decision just based on what they'd heard in court. Um, so um, uh, the jury was discharged and the newspapers were fined. But I always uh, feel that the, the real cost of this was the fact that those uh, women never got justice um, because uh, there, there was, um, uh, it was declared a mistrial for their, um, their particular cases. So um, uh, a lot of uh, suffering caused because people didn't obey the, the law of contempt. Remember Christopher Jeffries, I mentioned him last week, uh, he was wrongly accused of murdering his uh, um, tenant. Uh, now. Um, see those sorts of front pages that were, were published. Um, Joe's suspect is Peeping Tom, so they were accusing him of being the suspect and saying that he was um, obviously some uh, sort of weirdo. The, the son you can see there, the strange Mr. Jeffries, they got some background uh, information and the, another son headline about him, obsessed by death. This was all uh, before uh, any uh, sense that he'd been charged. It was just based on their suspicions and you can't, can't help but think it was just because he looked a bit strange. Um, they published all of this and they were uh, convicted of contempt uh, because they had um, vilified a witness or vilified a suspect, uh, which meant that witnesses were less likely to come forward. And if you remember that definition, substantial risk of serious prejudice or impediment uh, to active proceedings, well, the court ruled that uh, the Sun and the Mirror had created an impediment because by portraying Christopher Jeffries as uh, a weirdo that meant that fewer people were likely to come forward in his defence and um, uh, to act as witnesses for him. So uh, by uh, um, publishing prejudicial material, even before um, uh, he had been arrested, uh, they, uh, they were convicted of contempt. And one I was involved with, um, remember the Jamie Bulger case, a little boy who was abducted and killed by two other uh, boys. Robert Thompson and John Venables, um, there was a, a ban placed by a judge on identifying the location of the, uh, the children's homes where Thompson and Venables were being held. Um, and uh, we published uh, on the Magistrate News, we published a, a very simple sentence. Uh, we said that uh, Thompson and Venables were being held uh, at secure children's homes um, 13 miles apart in the northwest. I think that's the gist of uh, what we uh, reported. And a judge ruled that um, because there were only two secure ch uh, children's homes in the northwest, which were 13 miles apart, somebody could do their homework and um, work out which two children's homes they were being kept at. And that we had a fine of £30,000, but the costs on top of that, the cost of all the legal fees, came to nearly a quarter of a million pounds in total. So that's um, another example of uh, basically getting it wrong and uh, falling foul of the law of contempt. And I promise you, you won't keep your job very long. Uh, if you um, land your editor in trouble. Um, the, uh, the news desk I was working on then, uh, the news editor um, lost his job as the news editor for, uh, for that contempt. 
So how do judges um, interpret strict liability? Remember, strict liability means uh, that um, you're responsible no matter what um, you uh, deem to, um, to be responsible for a contempt. So um, a judge, uh, when uh, if there is a potential contempt, they'll say, well, how likely is it that a juror will see the publication? Um, they'll look at uh, the impact on the ordinary reader, because remember, it's got to be a substantial risk of serious prejudice. So they're, they're trying to weigh up the uh, uh, extent of the prejudice. Um, and they're also looking at the residual impact at the time of the trial. So the time when you publish something to when there's an actual trial and there's a jury, it's um, something known as the fade factor. It's a really important uh, thing and you can it helps us as journalists to be able to publish some things. If we publish them far enough before a trial, we can, uh, we can take a, a calculated risk that the fade factor will um, uh, will help us and uh, work to help us avoid being prosecuted for contempt. Um, just that first one was very briefly the likelihood a juror will see the publication. Better think about that. That that's used to work when newspapers were printed generally, and people would see the, your uh, article in a particular area quite often. Of course, now the internet means that uh, the chances of uh, somebody seeing it are very high. Uh, so even if it's published in the north of Scotland, someone who lives down on the south coast of England is very likely to see it. Um, so that is less of a uh, useful uh, element for us now. So the fade factor, this is um, really important. So the length of time between the publication of your article and the actual trial. So um, that's really important. The longer that uh, time uh, gap, then um, the, the greater the fade factor. And so the less uh, substantial risk of serious prejudice there will be. The area where the publication was made, but of course, with the internet, with internet publishing, it means that all publications are, are everywhere. So that's less useful to us now. Um, and the striking detail, which live on the minds of potential jurors. So when they talked about the strange Mr. Jeffries and obsessed by death, and, um, he was a peeping Tom. Those are very striking details, uh, which is why uh, a judge decided that that uh, the fade factor did not um, dismiss the impact, the seriousness of that prejudice. Uh, in that particular case. There you go. There's uh, Christopher Jeffries. Um, so even if there's no trial, it's, um, uh, it's not um, uh, enough to avoid being done for contempt if you've created an impediment to the course of justice. Demonize somebody like uh, Christopher Jeffries, that impedes justice. Uh, so people stop looking for other suspects, etc. And just to stress, Christopher Jeffries was completely innocent uh, of the crimes of which people um, uh, were accusing him of at that time. I'm just going to just mention though that uh, you can see how the fade factor works. So this was a case where a, uh, there was a, a minor crash uh, between an old gentleman and somebody else uh, and uh, the younger man got out and he stabbed the, uh, the old man to death uh, as part of a road rage crash. So. Um, you can see that it was, uh, this is published in July 2015. So um, the, uh, um, the stabbing actually happened on July the 16th. Um, and these publications were the following day. So this is a long time before there's going to be any sort of trial because this is happening right at the start. But those headlines are potentially in contempt of court. If you had published uh, those headlines during the trial, you would have been in contempt of court. So those newspapers have made a calculation that uh, they can talk about murdered for a minor prang. They can suggest, suggest that uh, the old man was murdered, uh, and hopefully by now you'll understand the difference between murder and manslaughter, that he was deliberately killed uh, for a minor prang. Uh, they can do that uh, at the beginning of the case like this because they know there's going to be a long time before the case comes to court. So they're relying on the fade factor to, um, um, to protect them. And you'll see here, uh, BBC, they were doing the same thing. They rather gone over the top with this little headline, Driver Murders Man 79. So that suggested he was guilty uh, when they uh, reported on that. And you can see they very quickly changed it to Findon Murder Probe as driver stabs fellow driver. So you can see that sometimes even the professionals get it wrong and they change things very quickly when they realize, oh, we got this one, uh, gone over the top on this one. So giving all this, what, what we know that um, uh, that when as soon as proceedings become active, i.e., there's a, a warrant for someone's arrest or there's an arrest, how do we appeal? How do we report on police appeals? 
So this is a case of Dale Cregan. Dale Cregan uh, was um, a greater Manchester gangster and uh, um, quite famous for having just one eye. And he um, was involved in a number of murders, uh, 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 gun murders, and then uh, went on the run and then lured some police officers, two policewomen, to a house uh, in, uh, just north of Manchester uh, and he killed them. Uh, and the police naturally wanted to catch him and they put up these um, uh, posters uh, in the city centre to try and find him. But of course with what we know about um, the law of contempt, strict liability contempt, I've told you that uh, we shouldn't be publishing uh, extra information. We certainly shouldn't be saying um, when proceedings are active that there's a £50,000 reward because that instantly suggests that he's guilty, doesn't it? Um, uh, so, and if we were to say that uh, the police really want to speak to him and they're trying to hunt him, that again suggests that he's guilty. However, there is a, a caveat, there is an ex exemption. Um, so this is another example, Raoul Moat, some of you may remember up in the northeast, Raoul Moat um, killed his, uh, 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 his ex-girlfriend's um, new boyfriend uh, and then shot a policeman in the face and then went on the run. And um, so again, that's a, another tricky one. So there's a, a warrant for his arrest. So under strict liability contempt, proceedings are active. So therefore, we shouldn't be giving very much detail. So how do you get away with a front page like wanted um, and clearly suggesting that he did it, gunman with a grudge? Well, this is how, because the Attorney General has said, we've got nothing to fear from publishing in reason terms, he says, anything which may assist in the apprehension of a, a wanted man. And I hope it will continue to perform this public service, says the Attorney General. So what they're saying is if the police issue an appeal to, uh, to try and catch somebody, um, then it's OK. Uh, that's an exemption where we can start to publish more information than we normally would when proceedings are active. However, once they've been arrested, once they've been caught, we need to go back to the normal rules and we need to uh, stop publishing prejudicial material at that point. OK, so that's um, uh, covered the uh, um, fade factor and uh, police appeals for information. So I'll stop this one now and I'll move on to the next one where we'll talk about uh, defences um, to uh, actions for contempt.